Welcome back to Royals Weekly. I am your host, Marcus Mead, and joining me as always, a man who was once forcibly removed from the Scott Bayo lookalike contest for being that guy, my brother Mike. Uh, I'm talking Joni Loves Chachi, or not Not Joni Loves Chachi, no, none of that stuff. This isn't Happy Days, Scott Bayo. This is Charles in Charge, Scott Bayo, okay? I'm more of a... <laughs> I, thought you, I thought you were going to go Storm in Capitals, Scott Bayo, but okay, whatever. Yeah, we'll yeah, yeah, I forgot, uh, yeah. Why, why I got to be Scott Bayo, okay? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I had to think of somebody. somebody cool. like, How about Mark Paul Gossler? I'll be Mark Paul Gossler all day. Okay? I'll be a Mark Paul Gossler look like. Who doesn't want to look like Zach Morris? That's pretty I mean, I impressive. Don't look anything like mind. him, but other than that. Yeah. <laughs> We're going to start this week with a big announcement. Are you ready for this, Mike? I'm ready. Royals Weekly is pivoting to video. That's right. You will now be able to consume even more Royals Weekly content on our newly created YouTube channel channel and Instagram account. You can watch video versions of this podcast and we're going to try producing at least one additional video a week. Maybe more than that once things get going. We'll see how things work out. This week's video is about the expectations set for Vinny Pasquantino or what we can expect from him as a hitter and player. So please, please, please go to YouTube, go to Instagram, subscribe and follow. We're called our our channel is called Royals Weekly. Okay. Try to keep it simple. Trying, trying to keep, keep it simple. simple. Our our Instagram, also Royals Weekly. So, you know, we were able to get in the ground floor of those names. So go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube, Royals Weekly. Subscribe to our or follow us on Instagram, Royals Weekly. You'll get a whole bunch more content from us, a whole bunch of analysis, highlights, and that sort of stuff. Uh, stuff that we can provide and, and help you get an even better experience. We're doing this expansion because of all the wonderful support that we've gotten from listeners. The more and more you tell us that you like stuff, the more you subscribe, the more you like and, and follow, the more we want to create content for you. So make sure you're liking all of our channels, all of our streams, and we'll do as much as we can to produce as much content for you to consume. Yeah, I'm excited to start the video editing. I'm also thinking the world just needs to see more of this. You know, yeah, uh -huh. I, if you uh -huh. can't tell, I have COVID right now. So uh, <laughs> I sound great, you know, sound great, look great, feel great, you know, play this great, is, baby. It's all going really well. Play great, you know, uh, so uh, I'll, remember, I'll never forget the more of me and how wonderful I look after my first shower in three days. So I'll, I'll never forget the first person who ever told me you look great, you play great. He spent like an hour before football games just taping up various parts of his uniform and body to be really symmetrical and pretty. And it was very yeah. like, uh, and he was like a very good football player. So, you know, well, maybe exactly you, you had the right about. answer. I know, yeah, exactly I know you do. I know, I know you do. I know you do. Let's get to the baseball. We'll start as we always do with roster news for this week. The big roster news, the thing we're, we're going to sort of focus a, a little bit of time on, Carlos Santana was traded to the Seattle Mariners for relief pitcher Wyatt Mills and prospect pit, pitching prospect William Fleming. Mike, were you surprised that the Royals were able to get anything for Carlos Santana? A lot of people were pretty shocked about it. They got something out of him, and this early before the trade deadline. Yeah, I was shocked, and, and partly the reason they got stuff was because they were willing to give up some money to pay off some of his contract they gave. And the Royals in the past have not traditionally been that willing to send money in trades with players. So they got, I, th I was hoping for one useful piece or one lottery ticket. We actually got both. And so we got a guy in Wyatt Mills who looks like he can be a part of a, bull, a major league bullpen. That's, that's a solid piece. Plus we're burning through bullpen arms so quickly right now. We needed oh, something. Yeah. And then <clears throat> uh, Fleming, the guy is in the low minors. He's, a uh, lottery ticket for to become a starting pitcher. I think he, you, you do what you do when you get lottery tickets. You look for one really good pitch. He has a pretty good slider right now. That's about it. Um, but <clears throat> hopefully with the Royals' great pitching development, they can develop him into a starting uh, pitcher for the future. Or, heck, who knows? Maybe he converts to a bullpen arm, and you end up with two bullpen arms out of him. That's great. A That's great, great slider. A great slider. Sounds like the next Jake Junis. He'll be great for uh -oh. the Giants in a few years. Yeah, the yeah, Giants. Yeah. Just, <laughs> they'll turn him into something magnificent in a few years. Yeah. yeah. Uh, no, interesting that they got something in return. A lot of people were talking about, was this worth it or not? We're going to talk a little bit more about that trade later on during our spotlight segment when we're talking about trades and the deadline and all that sort of stuff. But, yes, the Royals did trade Carlos Santana. He was hot enough that they were able to get something for him, and they got a couple returns. I think people are forgetting that they, they're paying, like, 80% of his the remaining salary. So really they, in my mind, they gave four and a half million dollars to Seattle for Wyatt Mills and William Fleming. That's, that's how I'm viewing this trade. But, you know, don't forget that when you're thinking about, well, was this a success or a win for the Royals that they're forking over some significant money in order to be able to get those prospects in return without that money, this deal doesn't happen. 
That deal, though, I think the most important ramification from that deal is it makes room for Vinny Pasquantino. The day that they announced the trade for Carlos Santana, they called up Vinny Pasquantino. Uh, they had to DFA Ronald Bolaños in order to make room on the 40-man roster for him because in the, Wyatt Mills was on the 40-man when he came back in trade. So they needed to open up a 40-man spot. They DFA'd Bolaños to do it. I think Bolaños will eventually end up in AAA Omaha. I don't think anybody's going to claim him. That's just a guess. I have no idea. But yes, Vinny Pasquantino was called up. Mike and I were there for his debut. Mike, what do you think about the call-up of Vinny Pasquantino? I think, I think we all know it's long overdue, um, but we're seeing already. He's, he, he's only got two hits, but I think he's walked like five or six times already. The guy is getting five on times. base like crazy. And that is exactly what we expected. He looks pretty comfortable in the batter's box already, which is great to see. Um, I, I was a little disappointed that Bolaños got DFA'd. I understand they had to make room on the 40 man, um, but I like him. I like his poss- him as a possible multi-inning guy later on if he ever figures out the command thing. So hopefully he does ba- end up back in Omaha, or at least that's what I'm hoping. Um, we, saw him make, we saw him have some really good outings last year. And so that's my, my hope is that he catches back on and, and can contribute in the future. Yeah, Pasquantino, it was great to be out there at his debut. The place was electric. There were a lot of people the there. It was Hawaiian was shirt night. Oh, they ended up losing that game, but it was still a great experience. You and I got really we nice still stayed tickets. stayed for the whole thing. because Stayed like, for the whole oh thing. What the heck? It was a great night to be out at the ballpark. And yeah. so, yeah, watching Pasquantino at the plate has been a real treat. And for those of you who haven't seen him in the minors, Mike and I have seen quite a few of his at-bats in minor league baseball. But – to watch him hit is like a thing of beauty. To watch him control the strike zone the way that he does is a thing of beauty. And like you said, he's walked five five times, been hit by a pitch, and he has two hits already. That means he's been on base, I think, eight times in 19, 19 plate appearances. Plate appearance, yeah. yeah, incredible, incredible stretch to start. I know it doesn't look great if you look at his batting average, but that's who he is. He'll, the hits will come, but he's, a, he's an on-base machine, and that's what he really needs to be. First hit was a home run. That was really cool to see. He smacked one out uh, during the – uh, I want to say during the second game, I want to say the second game of this um, Detroit series, which was awesome. It was like a real wall scraping, barely made it out line he got drive. Thrown out at second. <laughs> he got thrown out at second on a home run. It was a very yeah. odd thing, but man, did he spank that baseball? I think it was 112 going out. And so he's that, that I'm really excited to see. And you can see up and down the lineup. It just, it's changing the way that the lineup plays to have a guy in the middle who's going to take those that high quality of at-bats. So wonderful to see from him. Great to have him up finally. Next, Nate Prado. Here he comes, hopefully, before too long. Nick Prado. Uh, what did I say, Nate? Yeah. Sorry, He's too cool to be a Nate. He's way uh, well, too hey, cool Nate, to be a Nate. Nate Eaton is another guy who's pounding at AAA right now, and we'll That's see true. if he ends <laughs> up getting a, a debut before too long, too. I think I just conflated their names for some reason. Uh, also back with the team this week, Joel Piumps made his return, uh, did not fare great in the second Detroit game where he gave up two home runs in the ninth to lose it for the Royals. But it was good to see him back. Daniel Megden was sent down as a result. I thought Megden pitched pretty well for them. He did pitch really well for them in his limited exposure, so I'm sure he'll get another chance at some point. And then Matt Peacock, one of the Peacocks, the brothers Peacock, I don't think they're actually brothers. They're not uh, related DFA. anyway, but that's okay. They're not but they're okay. Uh, I'm calling them the brothers Peacock anyway. Uh, he was DFA'd this week. Again, I think he'll end up back in Omaha unless some team decides to take a chance on him. But I think uh, most likely he's back in with the uh, Storm Chasers. All of this, all this sort of exciting roster news led to a 3-3 three and three week for the Royals. Another 500 week. The third 500 week in a row. That brings their overall record to 29-48. and 48. That is 19 games under 500. Is this kind of what we thought they would be before the season? Everybody kind of had a, a record prediction somewhat close to 500 for the Royals. Ours was, or mine was 79 and 83. Are they playing, is, is, are they now to the point that we kind of expected them to be when the season started? I, I think record wise, they, well, no, overall record, no. Uh, but we kind of expected them to play around 500 baseball. I just don't know this is how we expected them to do it. I don't know that we thought that the bullpen would be this bad. No. I don't know that we thought the starting rotation would be this would struggle this much. I don't know that we thought that they would take as many walks as they've taken this year, especially lately. They've looked really good uh, with with taking walks. So I don't know if we got there the way that we thought we would, but we're at a place where we're playing 500 baseball. We're for the most part beating the teams that we should, um, in like the A's and the Tigers and some of the bad teams, and we don't beat the good teams. That's kind of how it goes. 
Yeah, this, I, it's sometimes in the past the Royals have looked like, oh, they're going to take two of three from a good team and then get swept by a bad team. They're not doing that this year. This year they're getting beat by the teams that should beat them, and they're losing to the team or they're winning against the teams who they should beat. Uh, now maybe they should take more from the teams they should beat. I really thought they should have swept this Detroit series to end the to end this uh, week. They they had the lead going into the ninth, and then they gave up two home runs, and that was that. Um, and but. It is interesting. I still, it still feels like there are a lot of missed opportunities for this team. The talent is there offensively. You can see the talent coming through. You can see the offense turning a corner with the addition of Pasquantino, with the growth of Bobby Witt Jr., although he's been struggling lately. The fact that they're they platooning just, a little bit more. They're platooning a little bit more. That's something that needs to be talked about because they platooned a ton today against Rivera the lefty and Tariq had a good day. And Emmanuel Rivera had a good day. And, you know, uh, Olivares had a really good day. And, you know, it, it looks – it looks smarter offensively up and down the lineup and they're taking more walks and having better approaches. And that's really paying dividends, but you still see the missed opportunities, especially with things like the bullpen giving up leads or Bubich goes out and he, he's kind of okay. He makes it through five, but he still doesn't look great. And it just, it's all, it's all these Bait. sort of like base running. Oh my Lord. Yikes. We talked about it on last week's episode, <clears throat> but bo- I've never seen a team get thrown out on the bases as much as the Royals did in this series slash throughout this season. It is incredible. It is an incredible thing to see a professional baseball team be thrown out on the bases as frequently as they are. I want to see stats on it. I don't know anybody who keeps, you know, thrown out on the bases stats, but I really want to see it because if there's a major league record for number of times thrown out on the bases, they have to be fighting for it this year, right? Oh, today was bad. Isbo was out by a long stretch at home. L- yep. <clears throat> Lopez fouls one off his foot and then tries to steal second base. He's out by two steps. <laughs> He's it's out like, by a mile. That wasn't even close. What are we doing, uh, guys? Yeah. This was, Lots this was of guys. Oh, uh, Whit Merrifield gets picked off at first. Like, yeah. <laughs> oh, Scoobo, oh, that was so hard the, to see. He starts with that old Danny Duffy just step off throw. And gets yeah. Him. Yeah. Yeah. That was, that was rough. Uh, Nicky may have gotten hosed on, at second, but he did have a really good game today, despite the fact that he was facing a lefty. So we threw him out there for strong performances this week. Mike, tell us how Nicky Lopez did this week, bouncing back and shoving it right in our face when we say he deserves to be a bench player. Yeah, uh, he was 7 for 17. One double, one walk, no strikeouts. It looked especially today like they were doing what pitchers are doing against Nicky Lopez, trying to throw him high fastballs so that he just pops it up because he can't hit one out. He was able to get on top of those fastballs today, hit two of them, two of the pitches I know he got hits on today. He was 4 for 4 today. Two of them went to left field, and they were high fastballs. And so if he can continue to do that, take some of those the other way and stay on top of them so that he's not popping them up, uh, he's got a chance to be a guy that can you, that will always make you ask the question: Should he be a bench player? <laughs> yeah, that's a, there were some. I started a little dialogue about it on Twitter, and somebody seemed to take the, the notion that uh, he was pushing back against being a bench player as me saying, "Oh, he shouldn't be a bench player." And I, no, I, I still think he should be a bench player. I still, but you know, a highly effective bench player who can hit a little bit, who can hit two seventy, walk enough, play good defense. That's a really valuable thing. And we shouldn't uh, we shouldn't scoff at it or anything. It's, if you can make a career out of doing that, you're doing great. And so, yeah, nice to see him have a really good day today going four for four. Hopefully he keeps hitting the ball well. He keeps finding ways to get on top of those fastballs or lay off of them and hit the ball the other way because, honestly, he's been, he's been pulling up too much all season. And it was nice to see him uh, intentionally take the ball to left field, which is his opposite field. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about Hunter Dozier today, another guy who uh, – I believe should be a bench player long term, but at least he went out and had a great week hitting this week. He was six for 19, had two doubles, a home run, a walk and five strikeouts. I think that start, another thing sparked a dialogue about like his role uh, on Twitter this week. And there are some out there who still apparently drink the Dozier Kool-Aid. I want to give credit to uh, Royals reporter Kev on Twitter, who uh, who started this dialogue with me, and he differ he disagrees with with the role should be, and he he's a very good writer. You should check out his stuff. Um, but I honestly think that Dozier's long term place on a good team is as a bench player because he's not great defensively, but he is adequate offensively. He's not great offensively. His OPS is still under eight hundred. He's not good enough. If for an everyday DH role in my mind, he just doesn't hit well enough for that, especially when he's going to be competing with guys like Pascantino and Prado and Melendez and Salvador Perez for that DH role there. He just can't compete with those guys offensively. I don't think at least at their peaks and his compared to his peaks. And so great week from him this week. Hopefully he keeps hitting. He keeps doing well, but I, I think long-term a really good bench player who can play, you know, 
DH first base for you and then maybe move around the outfield some, maybe play some third base, but you know it's not going to be great defensively, that can still be effective. As long as he can hit, you get a, you get a chance to play somewhere. Yeah, I'll move on to the weak performances because we think we kind of know what Hunter Dozier is as far as it goes offensively and a little bit weak defensively. Bobby Witt Jr., we're still trying to figure out, and he struggled a lot this week. Going three for 24, he didn't have any extra base hits. This is a guy who should be producing many extra base hits. Pretty much all of his hits should be, I mean, not all of them, but he should have a lot of extra base hits because of the power that he has. He didn't have any, and we always said, what's he doing strikeout-wise to walk-wise? That'll kind of tell you where he is. One walk to eight strikeouts. He he's Especially the last two games have been really rough for him. I'm calling for a Bobby Witt Jr. day off. Yeah, <laughs> he needs he needs to take a day off um, because he's pressing a little bit. He's and, and this is kind of the the weird thing. We said that as he takes a little bit, as his eye gets better and he takes starts taking more walks, they'll start throwing him more strikes. Well, they've started throwing him more strikes, but he's fouling off a lot of the pitches that mm-hmm. he needs to be putting into play. Willie Peralta gave him a hanging breaking ball that was right in the middle today, and he swung at it, but he fouled it off. You know. These are pitches he has to start doing damage on. And so hopefully as he uh, gets a little more comfortable, he will. But he needs a day off and he needs to refocus and, and kind of get back to where he is. And remember, this is, will be his first time in a, a long season like this uh, in the major leagues. So he's going to need days off. He's, we're not playing him every single day like Whit Merrifield. Get that out of your mind, Royals. He needs a day. Yeah, he needs a day. Uh, people forget that the major league season is actually longer than even the AAA season. It's longer than the minor league season. He's 21 years old, 22. I think he's still 21, right? Um, and so, you know, he, he needs some time every once in a while to just take a breath, get his mind right, and not wear out. He looks exhausted in the batter's box, honestly. When I see him in the batter's box, I'm like, man, dude just looks tired. Like, And so give him a day off. I'd even and- be okay if they were like, let's give him two days off. Let's rest him before an off day, or let's just say, Hey, for two days, you're just going to chill. Uh, take, take yeah. your time. You know, if and you it, want to figure something a, out with your swing, do it. But, it had a little bit yeah, of a rough just, series defensively as well. Had, had some, yeah, they, some issues. Defensively they, they bleed over, they bleed over, you know, they bleed over into each other. Another guy who's suffering sort of on both is my week performer of the week. Another young hitter that we're really excited about. MJ Melendez is another guy who got a day off today because he needed it. Right. He's not looked great defensively, which, you know, he hasn't since he came up. But it looks like he's pressing a lot. It looks like maybe that defense is bleeding into his offense a little bit. He was two for 19 this week with one double, zero walks, and six strikeouts. Zero walks is not a typical week for MJ Melendez. He is a patient hitter at the plate. He should be walking. And yet right now he just looks really frustrated, like he's really pressing. They're trying some stuff against him with inside fastballs and so forth that he's having trouble adjusting to. Um, he needs a day. Hopefully today allowed him to get his mind right to sort of refocus, get recharged and come out in this Houston series and feel like he can really uh, do some damage. Because when he's when he's right, having a guy like him and Pasquantino in the middle of the lineup will really pay dividends with the good approach that they have with the good at bats that they take. I uh, I'm wondering, you know, his offensive struggles almost seem to coincide with when he started catching every day. And yeah, that's kind of what scares me, because catching every day. It's a lot to prepare for if you're going to be catching that day. You know, you have to go into the pitchers' meetings. You've got to do all these different things, uh, game plan. Then you're catching before the game starts in the bullpen. Like I, I kind of wonder if uh, there isn't something to the fact that he's now catching a lot and his offensive numbers have dipped a lot. I know he's caught in the minors a ton and done both in games and been fine, but this is Major League Baseball. It's a little bit different, and that kind of worries me a little bit. If he's going to have be the long term answer at catcher. Um, I, it would not surprise me if at some point the Royals go, you're our backup catcher, you know, and you're you're our, our our guy we go to twice a week. And even with when it's Cam Gallagher in there, it wouldn't surprise me if they do that. I think especially I think you're especially going to see Singer and Gallagher more and more and more as we continue to go. Um, but, yeah, I, I think he needs he maybe needs to take that role. Maybe his role is more of a I catch two days a week, I DH and play first the other times or or outfield. Right. And the interesting thing is it was announced this week that MLB will transition or Rob Manfred in a press conference said that he thinks the automated strike zone will be put in place by 2024. Now, yay. what's interesting about Melendez is, yeah, the yay, finally. Um, what's interesting about Melendez is he gets hurt in the defensive metrics in large part because he's a bad framer of the baseball. I wonder if you don't have him be the backup catcher for two years, let Sal continue to catch, have him work on catching in the offseason and things like that. 
And then in two years, when the framing won't be so much of an issue, he can become your everyday catcher if need be, right? Yeah. If his receiving, if his receiving has gotten better, if his blocking of balls has gotten better and all that sort of stuff, maybe then he becomes your everyday catcher at some point. But for now, he's fine in right field. He can DH. He can play. He can catch every once in a while. If he needs to, he could probably play third at some point. You know, as long as his bat's in the lineup, I'm not too worried about I, I'd almost rather him have an easier load defensively than a really hard, complicated load like catching is. Um, but either way, I'm get, starting to get real excited, right? I, I, this team, to me, is starting to become more interesting. The call-up of Vinny Pascantino has really flipped a switch in me, and I'm like, oh, now I'm kind of even more interested. I feel myself being excited to watch the games every day because I know – in the middle of their lineup, they're going to have exciting young hitters. It's Bobby Witt Jr. hitting third and Pascantino hitting fourth a lot of the times. We saw it was – today it was uh, Bobby Olivares. Witt Jr., Edward Olivares, and then Pascantino. And it's like, yes, this is what I've been wanting to see. Get the exciting young hitters in there. Let them start figuring out Major League Baseball. And at, le- at the very least, fans will find it a more interesting brand of baseball to watch. And it has been over- since Vinny Pascantino got called up. I'm really excited to continue to watch the team and to continue to see the, tr- the moves that they're going to make to get all these young hitters up and get them in the lineup. Because that's what the future is going to look like. It's going to look like Pascantino, Olivares, Nick Prado, Isbell, those guys. Yeah, my theme for the week is all aboard the VP Express, man. Vinny Pascantino <laughs> looked great this week. I'm all all on board for him. Um, they serve Italian slow. breakfast on that yeah. train. Uh, all that's all they ever serve. What kind of <laughs> breakfast are you getting? Sausage, nothing but sausage. Okay, um, but yeah, he's he's. It was fun to watch him hit all week long. Uh, yes, he's slower than molasses on the bases, but he he played what looked like an adequate first base today, which was good for me. I'm, he's not going to win a Gold Glove, but he looked good over there. And so, yeah, and then I'm excited about some of those other guys to come in too. You know, we talk about Prado and Melendez and, and uh, Bobby Witt Jr., but Michael Massey looks really good right now. Um, yeah. Who's the, who's the kid they had playing center that's playing? Uh, Nick Lofton? Mm-hmm. Nick Lofton looks really good right now. You know, so hitting-wise, on the hitter side of things, we look – Tyler like Gentry was, looks really good Tyler right Gentry now. looks really good. You talked about him a few weeks ago. And so a lot of these guys are making us more excited. Now, when you look down there and you try and look at the pitching, these- eh, I don't know, but uh, but it looks like we ought to be able to score some runs for a little while, and that's and that's what everybody wants. Offense, baby, let's do it. <laughs> uh, here comes the quote unquote ad break. It's really, really, really important to us that you subscribe, rate, and review this podcast on whatever platform you use. Subscribing, rating, and reviewing helps more people find the show and lets us know what we're doing that we're doing something right and you want us to produce more content. The more you subscribe and like, the more content we produce. Plus, Mike gets all of his self-esteem from our subscriber numbers, so help him feel better about himself. He's got COVID. Help the guy feel better about himself and smash that subscribe button. On YouTube, whatever you sort of platform you use, YouTube. Uh, Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Spotify. Subscribe, 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 and rate us very highly. Give us the thumbs up. It's the thumbs up we crave. Um, smash that subscribe button. It's free. It takes about half a second, but it does us a world of good. So please, please uh, take the time to do that. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and our new Instagram. We post a ton of additional analysis on there every day. I'm on Twitter all the time. It's ruining all of my personal relationships, but I'm doing it for you guys. So inter- And we interact with whoever's willing to talk to us on there. So you want to talk to us? Shoot us a question. Shoot us a statement. Tell us we're stupid. It doesn't matter. We'll still interact with you. So come connect with us on social media. Follow us. Subscribe and like. It'll be the best thing you've ever done. The Royals really kicked off trade season. I think trade season officially started when they traded uh, Carlos Santana to the Seattle Mariners for, and brought up Vinny Pascantino. Uh, so for the next month, trade news and draft news will really drive the Royals conversation as the team looks to set itself up for drastic improvement next year and the seasons to follow. We're going to focus on this week's spotlight segment on the trade market and potential trade opportunities for the Royals with an eye toward understanding how the team may look heading into next season. We may also touch a little bit on draft stuff in this conversation. That's just because the draft's coming up and it's on my mind and I'm working on the draft guide for uh, Kansas City Sports Network and all that stuff. Uh, But let's start with the trade talk and we'll start with the Santana trade just to break it down a little bit more. There was a lot of discussion about it and whether or not the Royals were justified in hanging on to Santana for so long. Mike, how do you feel about the trade now that we're on the other side of it? Was it justified? Was it not justified? Give us your thoughts. I think it was really justified and this is odd because... I think the Royals actually pulled the trigger at about the right time. 
Um, if you wait any longer, who knows what Santana does? Who knows what Seattle's chances are? Like maybe they go on a long losing streak and not really looking for players. But I think that they really did a good job in that Santana trade. And I think them showing the willingness to pay for some of his salary is something that you can use moving forward and say, okay, if it's going to mean the difference between getting a nothing or getting something that might be a usable piece in return, yeah, go ahead and spend that money now because you're going to be spending it in the off season to find a usable piece anyway, to fill holes in the bullpen or whatever, or to get depth for a bench player, whatever you need. So I think it's encouraging to see that from them. So overall, I liked the trade. And, uh, you know, the best to Carlos Santana and the future, his future as a Seattle manager and guitar player. Yeah, yeah, that'll be nice to see. Uh, when he's inducted in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, that'll be great. <laughs> good good, good you. moment for him. I think he's already in there, honestly. Yeah, probably. Um, he should be uh, if he's not. He should be. Uh, I'm, I'm sort of uh, of a mixed mind on this one. I think, yes, it's great that they got something for him. That is, there is, you know, objectively good that they got something for him. I still think we're underselling the opportunity cost of, like, hanging on to him and not bringing up Pasquantino. I think we're underselling the degree to which something was lost there. The degree to which fan the fan base was angered. F- some fans tuned out. Pasquantino lacked that development that was going to happen in, in that time. You know, I know it's like saying, like, well, they got something for him. They did, but we're also underselling the fact that they had to pay money to get that, right? They, so let me ask you this. If they had paid, let's say, $6.5 million, not of his contract, let's just say they had given Seattle $6.5 million, could they have gotten – those two prospects just for the money? Like, you know, I don't think so. We don't, we don't know. Right. But like we're underselling the degree to which we essentially just gave them $4.5 million for Wyatt Mills and this guy. And then they got Santana as well. But I think we're underselling the degree to which that money played a huge part in getting them. I think it's great that they got something for them, but ultimately I'm like, I'm not going back on the notion that like, I'm not saying like, Oh, everybody who wanted him, you know, DFA was wrong. It's great that he turned it around. You know, it's great that he, you know, got, you know, and then they're not going to just lose that money for nothing now. But at the same time, I'm like, eh, I, I feel like we're not giving enough credit to the opportunity cost of what was lost playing him for that month. You essentially bagged the 2022 season because of performances like Carlos Santana's to start the year, right? Because of guys like him and the terror, you know, other guys, but, were terrible. You bagged the 2022 season. You couldn't do something like DFAM and bring up that Pasquantino because it looked like he was ready. And so, you know, it, to me, it's almost like a coin flip, but you know, I am glad that they ended up getting guys in Wyatt Mills and this lottery ticket Fleming because Mills, I think has already picked pitch for the Royals and he looked okay. Uh, a side winding righty, but you know, I, I'm not like as, as gung ho that this was the right decision as possible. And I don't want to reinforce the Royals notion that waiting is always the best option option because you yeah. know honestly if they, they're like oh everybody loves the fact that we waited you know like god don't reinforce the goodness of their conservatism because it's not good yeah and so essentially what you're saying is did we get something back that was worth pasquantino staying in the minors for an extra two months okay. yes um would it have been better to just dfa santana two months ago and bring pasquantino up I, I don't know if that you, you can't say whether that's you can't it's impossible and, to and say. We won't, and we won't know until like, you know, we get the final numbers on Mills and, you know, Fleming. If Fleming yeah. never makes it to the majors and Mills is only ever worth half, half a war for his whole career or something like that, we won't really know. Or for the Royals, we won't really know, you know, until we see ultimately what these guys do. But, you know, yeah. it just. I, I, yeah. I, the real thing is this. They could have held on to Santana longer. Okay? Yeah. That was, <laughs> realize that they could have held on to him for another month and then DFA'd him. You know, and yeah. they got nothing. I, just, I, I don't want to set the bar that low for them. Yeah, there were so many people like, oh, they made it. Th- they made the right decision. They knew all along. It's like, no, this is still not the best outcome. This is still the like eighth or ninth best outcome for this. They should have traded him halfway between last season. Like in the in the before the trade deadline last year is when they should have gotten rid of him. But yeah. the fact that they waited and waited and waited means they get this return instead. And it's and like that's the better than thing. nothing. But our bar is so low, people were celebrating that it was better than nothing. That's how yeah. low our bar is. The scary thing is Whit Merrifield's in pretty much the same situation right now. Oh, yeah, and for sure. We'll see if they do the exact same thing because it's really that's what they've done. They have been unwilling to trade guys who have more than a year uh, still left on their deal. And mm-hmm. it costs them every single time because it's like, 
who's going to pay for half a year of something? They're yeah, not. Good, like, yeah. It just doesn't happen yeah. anymore. You used to be able to or do it. You had a veteran slugger. You could send them, sell them off for a half a year or a starter who was aces. You could sell them off for a half year, get a big return. It doesn't happen anymore. No prospects are valued too highly. Now you can't yeah. do that anymore. And so, yeah, uh, they're losing value all the time because of it. Um, they've already lost the value on what Maryfield that's already gone. And so hopefully they end up getting something for him. But when they do, I don't want to hear from the fan base. Yay. They, they did great. They won. Yay. No, no, they lost. They have already lost on Whit Maryfield. That is lost. Okay. They, th- yes. Great that they salvaged something if they get something, but they have already lost that deal. Okay. Doesn't matter what they get now. They've already lost it. Uh, let's talk about some trades that they may ultimately end up making. Santana is gone. The obvious candidates now to be traded are Benintendi, Merrifield, and maybe Michael A. Taylor. Some people might talk about Brad Keller, too. I don't know. I don't think they'll ever do that. And they're really weak in pitching right now. So they really can't afford to be giving up any starter who is even marginally effective for them. Um, ben Attendee has been linked to the Blue Jays. We've heard reports that they're interested in him. We've spoken in the past about what we'd like to get in return for some of those guys. So if you want to go check out those episodes, Mike, I want to ask you, broadly speaking, what do you want to see the team look like by the end of this trade deadline? So by the end of the trade deadline, Merrifield should for sure be gone. Ben Intendi for should for sure be gone. I'm, I'm of the feeling that Michael A. Taylor should be gone as well. I know he's played a lot better, um, but He's done after next year. Yeah, done after next year, right? And mm-hmm. yeah. he's 31, 32. I just don't 31. think he's going to He's going to yeah. So he's I just don't think he's going to be on the next good Royals team and if you can get something valuable for him, I think you get rid of him. Um but mostly the big thing for me is I want to see Kyle Isbell, Edward Olivares, Nick Prado getting substantial at bats by the end of this trade deadline. By the end of the trade deadline, they should all be in Major League Baseball. And they should be getting consistent at bats. You know, if it's platooning Isbell and Olivares, I'm okay with that. But we need to know. We need to start learning about some of these younger guys. Once we've gotten rid of, of those those other guys, I don't want to see him hang on to Wit because what they'll say they'll come out and go, "Oh, we got the opportunity to trade him at the end of the year. Hopefully, he gets his value up." And like we just talked about, it's not going to happen because yeah. it's more valuable to have him for a longer period of time. Um, or they'll so give yeah. you some sort of narrative that's like, we got all these young players. We need a real veteran presence in that clubhouse yeah, some to lead them maybe. and teach them, teach them how to put their socks on and all that sort of stuff. It's really <laughs> important stuff. You know, like so talent, yeah, like talent, nah, leadership, that, leader, teach yeah. them how to be gritty, you know, that, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, yeah, that's ridiculous, but we'll see. <laughs> so I got to see those guys getting consistent at bats by the end of this. But one other thing, and this is not major league necessarily. It's what do we see in the minors? At the end of this trade deadline, and really the draft is important too, but it'll mostly be from the trade deadline, we need to see some of the organizational depth be filled a little bit. And I'm talking about center field and third base for the most part. We are really lacking in those areas, and so I'd like to see some of the prospects that we get back in some of those trades fill some of those spots, or starting pitching. I'd take that as well. Yeah, the starting pitching is actually the thing that is most concerning to me. I, I know that a lot of people are talking about third base. Some people are talking about center field. I'm very comfortable with Isbell in center field. If you look at his defensive metrics right now, he's actually ahead of Michael A. Taylor and outs above average. And he's getting one. He's in the 100th percentile in jumps in center field. And so I'm happy with Isbell in center field. I'm much more concerned about the pitching. I think third base can be solved eventually in some way. Massey, where they get somebody Lofton in a trade. Lofton can play third. Lofton maybe can play third. Uh, somebody either in-house or via a trade to get a prospect in here could fill third base. Even Emmanuel Rivera could do the job if we're not, you know, if we have a really good lineup around him, he could do the job. The thing that I'm concerned about is the pitching. That is the only thing that really concerns me at this point moving forward. I want the team to target some rotation pieces at this trade deadline to make sure that it's immortal. It's sort of like a solve the rotation issue with pitcher overkill. Bring in as many pitch starting pitching prospects as you can find and get high value ones. I'm, I'm comfortable packaging, you know, Michael A. Taylor and, a, and, a, and Scott Barlow. Think of the return you could get for Michael A. Taylor and Scott Barlow. That's your most valuable position player prospect or position player on the trade market, along with your most valuable bullpen piece. Package them and see if you can get a legit starting pitching prospect. Just do something to get some starting pitching prospects because I want to sort of solve this problem with quantity, knowing that their pitching development is so bad we're not going to be able to solve it with quality. We're not going to be able to like, you can't get high end pitching prospects in the, at the trade deadline anyway. 
And so find a way to do it with multiple pitching prospects or something, because right now they have a problem in the rotation in the next few years. Solving that problem will make them a much more competitive team. And that's where I think they need to spend their time and money and, and draft capital and trade capital focusing on, honestly, not necessarily draft capital, but definitely their trade capital needs to be focused on pitching to some degree. So the trade deadline is fast approaching. The draft is coming up in two weeks. It's, it's, a, it's a month of interesting stuff for the Royals in terms of team building. How important do you feel like the next month is for their future? The draft, I think, is the 17th. The trade, de- trade deadline is in early August. How important is the next month to their future, to their front office and their performance, to shaping this team for the next four or five years as they try and open a competitive window? I think the draft is more important than the trade deadline in that sense. And for the same reasons that you and I just talked about, we, they, they have some serious depth at center field, third base, and starting pitching in the minors. And so that's what they have. You to mean lack at. of depth? That's what I meant. They have depth a lack itch, of depth? Yeah. Depth issues, I mean. Oh, okay. Um, and so, like, you know, um, that's I think the draft is going to be very important for that. Now, I still, and this is more about what what is available in the draft, I still think with that first pick they need to go college hitter. But that doesn't mean that you can't take – some guys in the draft. There's not a lot. This kind of sets up poorly for the Royals because this is a really bad class for college pitching. And it's so really bad guys that are advanced enough to get through and really get to the majors quickly aren't aren't coming out in the draft this year. So, you know, but find some guys that you feel like can be quality arms in your system, and then or or be smart about it. Take the best guy, guys that are close to be you know can take those college hitters, and then down the road you've trade them off for pitching. Once they've shown that's, that they can hit at the major league level, you know, that's, that's an option as well. So I think, I think either way, as we move forward in the next two or three years, if the Royals have a competitive team, you'll see them going out and having to spend or trade for starting pitching. I think that's the that's point the that thing, we've reached at this point. That's, that's the approach that I'm really interested in seeing. So here's a radical idea for the trade deadline. What, I think they should be both, buyers and sellers at the trade deadline. And maybe they won't be buyers at the trade deadline. Maybe they wait till the off season. But the big point is they need to be more transactional, leverage their good hitting development to get some pitching prospects that are going to be useful like to get some, or even some major league pitching. You know, why can't you go trade for a guy like John means in Baltimore? You know, why can't you go trade for somebody who is a I think means is down for the year. If I'm not mistaken. Yeah. But a guy like that, a guy who yeah. is on a bad team, but is a useful productive, reliable starting pitcher at the major league level, go trade for him because you have hitting prospects that are valuable. You know, this is going to sound crazy, but why not trade Nick Prado, right? Why not trade him? Why not trade, you know, Tyler Gentry? Why not trade Tucker Bradley? Why not trade, you know, some of these guys at the lower levels who look like they're going to be good hitters for you. You have the opportunity to trade them and get some pitching prospects in here. They're going to draft a guy probably a college hitter, hopefully a college hitter at nine. And maybe in a year they trade him for somebody more valuable or for somebody major league ready pitching. They, I think, I think their pitching problems probably get solved either signing guys in free agency or trading for guys who are already pitchers because we know it's not going to get solved from them developing guys or we're pretty confident. They've been very bad at that. Let's be honest. When they were really good in fourteen and fifteen, it was on the back of pitchers that they got from other places, yes, either signed in free agency or traded for. It was not on the back of guys they developed. You no. know, if you think we got, uh, oh god, Shields in a trade with Tampa, we got mm-hmm. Volquez in free agency, we got Cueto in a, in a trade. Like the only guy we got, that we got, really Chris Young, we got Jeremy Guthrie. We signed both of them. Like, yeah, the only guy that really contributed. There are two guys, maybe Danny Duffy and Jordano Ventura. Like those were guys that really contributed the, to the starting rotation that were developed by the Royals. And so, yeah, I don't, uh, I don't, I, I think we've come to a point now where we can pretty firmly say they're going to have to do some things via trade and free agency if they're going to be competitive in 24, 25, 26. Yeah. The Royals start this week in Houston for a four game set. I promise. For those of you, I, I apologize for lying to you last week and <laughs> saying that the it. Royals were playing Houston. I'm, I just, I huff a lot of paint is the problem. Yeah. And so, you know, I need, I need to stop, but I promise this week they're starting the series in Houston to start the week. 
before coming back home for a three-game series against the Cleveland Guardians. Mike, tell us about this Houston team for the second time in two weeks. Uh, well, this Houston team is pretty good still. We talked about still, how good they were last good. week. They're 51-27, and 27 and they lead the AL West by 13 and a half games. That's really good. Um, and unlike us, they have developed a lot of their own guys. Maybe not all of their yeah, pitching. Yeah, they have. But their uh, position guys well, are pretty much all. They the find a way to get guys from wherever and turn them into good pitchers. Look at Jake Odorizzi, who you're going to talk about here in a second. Yeah, he, John Heasley versus Jake Odorizzi, the 32 year old right hander, originally drafted by us. He was part of that James Shields trade. And uh, 3.13 ERA, 1.17 whip. He's had a good career already. Real steady guy. Not, not a great, not one great pitch on Jake Odorizzi, um, but he's got four solid pitches. Uh, throws 58% fastballs, but he throws low to mid-90s on his fastball. Um, in the second game, we should see Grenke versus Luis Garcia, who's had a really good year, a 25-year-old righty at uh, the 3.54 ERA. He's a mid-90s fastball guy with a cutter, changeup, and a slider. Uh, they're hitting his fastball pretty well at 287, so hopefully the Royals are able to. I don't know that the Royals are what I would call a great fastball hitting team, but mm-hmm. we'll see if they can uh, handle Luis Garcia. Then we got uh, Brad Keller. This is a four gamer, so we'll have Brad Keller versus Christian Javier, twenty-five year old right hand. He's having a phenomenal year, two point yeah. five eight ERA. He's got a WHIP under one, so he's let you know that's walks and hit plus hits per innings pitch. He's letting less than one guy uh, really on base per inning, which is really good. He's got a fastball in the mid nineties, slider, curveball, changeup. Throws his fastball a lot, and opponents don't hit it very much. You know, 151 batting average against on his fastball. And that last game will pit two guys against each other that are real different. you got uh, <laughs> Chris Bubich is going to go up against future Hall of Famer Justin Verlander, 39-year-old righty out of Old Dominion. I did not realize he went to Old Dominion. Yeah. Vinny Pasquitino is an Old Dominion guy, right? I hope Vinny hits a home run off him. Me too. I hope Vinny... And then, and then starts whatever there. And then starts singing the old Dominion fight song. Running I don't. Around yeah, the I don't know what their mascot is, but he needs. To, I don't either. Like do the mascot I like, dance. I think they're like the. Uh, I don't know. Here, keep is old Dominion thing in Virginia? I'll, yes, it is. It is. Okay, uh, I couldn't remember. That's yeah, anyway. Go look I'm up their find mascot out. for me. I'm looking it up right now. Uh, so it up right those now. are two very different pitchers, as you guys probably know. Justin Verlander's generational talent. He's got a 2.03 ERA. He also has a WHIP under one. Still throwing in the mid-90s with his fastball, slider, curveball, change. Doesn't throw his change very often. Um, they're not Opponents aren't hitting over 200 on any of his pitches. How this guy has been this good for this long is baffling. Came up with the Tigers. Used to kick the living crap out of the Royals when he was in the AL Central all the time. He is such a great pitcher. Let's hope Bubich can get through some innings. That's all. We just want you to get through some innings. Luckily, he doesn't have to, you know, he doesn't. Verlander won't be pitching against him. So like, right. You know, he's just he, going to have to face guys like face Jose Alto, the, Alto, Altuve and uh, what Jordan, Jordan Alvarez, Alvarez and Alex Bregman and <laughs> those guys. And that's Pena, all he's got to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's all he's got to do. You know, so, uh, Payne, you might be hurt right now. He was hurt there for a second. So. I think he hit a walk off uh, today or yesterday. I can't okay. Maybe he came back. He was on yeah. like the 10 or 15 day aisle there for a while, but yeah, he's, uh, it's going to be a real, real tough series in Houston. Uh, Old Dominion, by the way, is the Monarchs. The monarch. So right? put that crown yeah. on Vinny Pascantino. Put that put crown that on crown Vinny Pascantino. You take Vinny. Verlander Yard and you shove it right in his face. <laughs> you shove it right in his face. And then, and then when the old tires game at Old Dominion happens and it's just you and him. I don't know anybody else went to Old Dominion. <laughs> As anybody else? Yeah. Uh, I'm sure some other guys went there. The um, alumni yeah, game, you can really you got a story to you tell. Can really, you, know? you got bragging rights. Um, That's right. After they face Houston, they're gonna come home for a start a home stand with the Cleveland Guardians, who are forty and thirty six, which puts them second in the AL Central. 40 and 36 is good enough for second in this division. They're two games back of the Minnesota Twins. We don't have probables for this game. Offensively, the Guardians have been, I think, better than ex- than people expected a little bit. They're getting what I would call like mediocre performances from most of their lineup. And then a an, uh, phenomenal, incredible performance this year offensively from Jose Ramirez. So yeah. one guy is destroying and the rest of the guys are doing good enough, you know, like, so they're getting pretty good years out of Josh Naylor and, and Steven Kwan has been pretty good for them. Ahmed Rosario has been pretty good. I like them. Ahmed but, Rosario a lot. Uh, yeah. He's just a solid ball player. He plays multiple uh, Ramirez. Positions. Yeah. He's a good guy. And has an OPS plus over 100. What, what else can you ask for? And Josh Ramirez, Naylor though, scares the shit out of me. So <laughs> Ramirez should should be the one that scares the shit out of everybody because Ramirez oh is He's phenomenal this year. He's got a 173 OPS plus right now. 
and they locked him down on a long-term contract, smart from Cleveland. And they got a pretty good farm system right now. That team is kind of working it as a small market team, knows how to produce and stay competitive, I think. Uh, their pitching staff has also rebounded this year. They were pretty weak a little bit last year, kind of hurt uh, on, in the rotation especially, but they've they've gotten back to a pretty solid starting pitching from them, including from Shane Bieber, who uh, his velocity has dipped quite a bit this year, but he still remains pretty solid in his overall numbers. He's got a 3.16 ERA and a 2.84 whip. Like I said, we don't have probable, so we don't know if we're going to face Bieber or not. But uh, we'll see what the rest of that uh, team looks like if, if we don't get a chance to see him here back in Kansas City. One one correction there. 2.84 FIP, not WHIP. Sorry, what and did I say? Sh- Sorry. You said WHIP. Yes, 2.84 FIP. That would be FIP. a terrible WHIP. You don't want that. That would be a terrible um, WHIP. It's a great <laughs> fielding independent pitching. It would be a terrible walks plus hits per inning pitched. But uh, Bieber, just the breaking ball on that guy is unreal. And he can live on it. He can just throw that thing all the time. So it's good to watch him pitch. I like, I like watching him pitch. But yeah, Josh Naylor. Like, there's something wrong with that dude in the think meet. He is, he is <laughs> like uh, in, Captain Insano. Did you see that thing the other day when he hit the walk off? He was like headbutting no. dudes that were wearing helmets. No. He didn't have his helmet on no. anymore. He's headbutting no. them. Football. Let's style. get him like, out there. Like, you see the ugly guard doing football. You know, like yeah, I'm a guard. I'm a dirt bag. Wham! That's what Naylor was doing. He's a psycho. Let's let's get Amir Garrett out there pitching to Josh Naylor. There we go. That's what we need. <laughs> That's what we need. We need oh, the anger streak of Amir Garrett. And, uh, They're going to yeah. start handing out uh, suspensions before the game even happens. If that, if that's going to be the case. We'll end this week's episode like we end every episode with our Just A Bit Outside segment where we talk about something that's interesting to us outside the world of baseball. Mike, you have COVID. You're in the house. You probably got some things you can do. Tell us what's going on in Mike world besides COVID. Well, some people call it grandpa's old cough medicine. Some people, you know, it, it gets you get you right when you need a, a little a pep up from having COVID. I would like to talk about my favorite whiskey. So I'm a whiskey drinker. I, li- I like to drink whiskey when I do drink. Um, For those and, of you who've heard the episodes before and you heard the clinking of ice in a glass. Every once in you, a while. You know will, that Mike is a whiskey drinker. I will. Uh, yeah. <laughs> if you listen carefully. It ain't, ice, it ain't ice water. People. It is not it ice ain't water. Ice water. No. Um, and so sometimes I will have a drink uh, while I'm. <laughs> Uh, recording, but I, I, a few years ago, this is probably five years ago now. A good friend of ours um, came up, and he's a whiskey guy as well. And so he told me about this Irish whiskey that he actually learned about from some famous wrestler because he's friends with a, a guy in the WWE. And so it's like it's a long story, but he heard about it through that friend he has in the WWE. I guess one of the guys in WWE is Irish, and he was like, "Hey, you should drink this whiskey. It's called Teeling Irish Whiskey." And it's not crazy expensive. It costs you about what a bottle of Jack Daniels would. It is so damn good, though. And when we were sitting here thinking, well, what do you want to do for your just a bit outside this week? All I was thinking was, you know, I'm kind of sick. I'm, I kind of would like a drink right now of some grandpa's co- grandpa's old cough medicine. And uh, what would I like? I would love some teeling right now. Unfortunately, I don't have any in the house. And I have no way of leaving the house because, you know, I'm, I have COVID. And so I, I won't get any teeling today. But. Gosh, I highly recommend if you're a person who likes a good wh- Irish whiskey, Teeling is is not crazy expensive, but crazy good. So give it a shot. I I really can't speak to the goodness of Teeling Irish whiskey or any whiskey. Uh, I, I don't drink. Mike Mike does. That's kind of the basic I, biggest. I do the drinking for the both of us. Yeah, so. he does. He does the drinking for the both of us. Uh, I do the driving for the both of us when when is when is necessary. Uh, but <laughs> <laughs> less cool, I guess. Uh, but I yeah. do love drinking <laughs> culture, and uh, I find it cool that there are these like, you know, you know, whiskeys people don't know, or you know, there's like I just I just find the whole thing very cool. I understand why people do it. You know, like it's a it's a it's a cool thing to go through the liquor store and like, ooh, that's a cool bottle. Ooh, that one looks nice. I yeah. don't know the difference between any of them. <laughs> well, the the better the, what I find whiskey wise, the better looking the bottle. A lot of times, the worse it tastes. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> ooh, this one's really bottle. expensive. <laughs> <laughs> Blah, it's yeah. garbage. It's yeah, it and, like and garbage. The price doesn't always mean uh, quality. Sometimes you know you'll find. Some that are expensive that, that are really, really good, but um, I'm not. Price means nothing to me. I drink Evan Williams regularly. It's not expensive at all. Um, but yeah. Get you some tealings, people. Or tealings. Yeah, I, I tealings. don't have any, but I'm going to go probably have an Evan Williams, see if I can clear up this stuff in my head. Well, I'm talking about something a little different, and that's a con artist or a con man. Actually, it's a book I'm reading. It's called The King of Confidence, and it is a wild story about this dude named James Strang. James Strang, if you don't know who he is, 
led basically – well, not basically. He led a cult in Michigan in the mid-19th century, so just before the Civil War started, about 10, 15 years before the Civil War started. He was – became like a Mormon at one point, just like a, a real shady, shifty dude who became a Mormon when they were living in Wisconsin, I think. Like Joseph Smith was living in Wisconsin or something. Like I'm trying to follow the story. Na- yes, Navu, that's what it was. Illinois. Navu, Illinois. Yep, yeah. Navu, Illinois. Yep. And he met – or maybe that's met where Joseph, Joseph Smith, Smith once. died, by the way. Or Joseph Smith died. Joseph Smith, yeah. When he died, Strang took the opportunity to start like a splinter cell – where he then made himself like a king, basically, right? Yeah. And he sort of declared himself a prophet and like forged these like uh, tablets that he found. And it was a it's a very wild story about how I'm only halfway through it right now, but it's like enthralling. This book is it's like reading about all these weird characters from the mid 19th century who you know people believed a bunch in. And the thing I find most interesting about it is the way that the book talks about how people were ready to believe in something unusual at this time, like paranormal things or, or, you know, yeah. a, a prophet coming or th- because, because times were so tumultuous back then, because there was this, you know, lingering notion of, will there be a civil war? And there's all this, you know, turmoil in the country. Anytime things are like that society, people in society are more ready to believe that it's the end times or that, you know, follow people who are, you know, confident, honestly, who just seem like they have answers. People are more willing to follow them in times when, there's turmoil and strife. And so it, it made, makes me think a lot about our times now. There's a ton of turmoil in the U.S. right now and in the world, really. But it makes me not so surprised that there are people out there sort of peddling garbage and, and just these ridiculous narratives who are being followed by large amounts of people. And this is a guy in James Strang who we've never heard of. I'd never heard of him. And now I start reading this book and realize he controlled like a quarter of the state of Michigan. Back in this time, right? Like, so <laughs> was led by this dude who thought he was like, or really maybe didn't even think he was, but it convinced a bunch of people that he was a prophet and a sort of king, a God king on earth and all this sort of stuff. And it's just a very interesting story. I love, I love stories about cults and things like that. It's very interesting to me. And so, yeah, if you ever get a chance, the book's called The King of Confidence. It's a real page turner, honestly, for a, for like a, a nonfiction book. And uh, I, I really enjoy it. If you want int- to, if you're interested in learning things about that, about things like that, give it a shot. Now, that sounds like a book I would read. You recommend books yeah. to me all the time that are like, I, I would never read that. You recommend these fantasy books to me and stuff I don't ever read. This is actually one I would actually read. <laughs> uh, you didn't ever tell me about this, but okay. Okay, it's an interesting book. And, you know, it kind of reads like a fantasy book sometimes when you hear people talking about like, you know, I found these magical tablets or I, you know, I did this. They, you know, God spoke to me yesterday. You know, like it, it's a very sort of a fantastical thing in, in places. But uh, I really like it because I like understanding the psychology of people who can um, do bad things, uh, convince people of certain things that are very obviously not true, and then use that power to do bad things that that interests me in a great way maybe 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 that should scare everybody i don't, I don't know <laughs> i do have a platform here so who knows you know but, um that's enough talking about the things that interest us outside of baseball hopefully the royals can grab some wins this week it's going to be a tough series against houston another tough one against cleveland hope to see you back here make sure to follow us on facebook twitter our new instagram subscribe to us on youtube we're building out more content we're doing lots of fun things and we'll see you here again next week and every week but until then be good to each other and go royals <laughs>